Welcome to Numerical Methods 2450. If you're in the wrong course, uh, this is your opportunity to catch up with the true course you're signed up for. I will start with a question displayed here on this awkwardly placed screen in this classroom. This is the first time we teach this course in this class, but we'll make it work. So what happened on June 23, 2020? Well, congratulations for getting married, um, and that's true, so, okay, what else happened? Okay, okay, that too. Um, clearly, many of you were probably still in high school, right? You were doing your lectures over Zoom because of the COVID shutdown. Your colleague said that the COVID-19 vaccines were kind of starting to roll in, um, but something happened to me and my research group here at the university. On June 23rd, 2020, we received an email from former president Dave Pershing, president of the University of Utah. And if the president emails you, you like leave everything and answer that email. And he emailed us said, he said that this person named Pat Richards, Patricia Richards, as you see here at the bottom, interim president and CEO of the Utah Symphony and Utah Opera. Ooh, fancy. Arts and science. So what did they want? At the time, every single orchestra, national orchestra in the U.S., there are 316 of them. Any of you instrument players, classical instruments? Okay, wind, woodwind, brass instruments? Okay, great. So you might have guessed what they were worried about. So woodwind and brass instruments, they generate a lot of respiratory droplets on the reed, at the tip of the instrument. You cannot mask them. It destroys the acoustics. If you were a violin player or a piano player, you could put a mask on without affecting the sound. But if you're a trumpet player or a trombone player, they tried to put a mask on, didn't work. So you're a respiratory droplet generator. And if you happen to be sick, people had no idea kind of about the severity of COVID-19. Vaccines were still kind of, you know, mildly available at the time. Um, so they wanted to find a way. Maybe they could come back to practice. Maybe they get a sense of normalcy. And again, all 316 of national orchestras in the United States were all shut down and grounded. This is a picture of Abravanel Hall, named after Maurice Abravanel, the first conductor of the Utah Symphony. If you haven't been there, you should, just to stand in awe and wonder at this magnificent hall. This is a full orchestra. This is a picture of the true orchestra, the Utah Symphony, full orchestra playing at the stage of Abravanel Hall. And they wanted to see if they could come back and play. So they reach out to us chemical engineers, like, hey, there's like droplets going in the air. These droplets might have a virus in them. Could you help us figure out if we can come and play without having to worry about us all getting sick and you know, bad things happening to us? So indeed, um, this is a Schlieren showing, this is an imaging technique, showing a trumpet playing. There's some things going on here, but you see at the tip of the, um, of the instrument, there's this airflow containing respiratory droplets coming out and spreading. So imagine you have 12, 16 instruments in a full orchestra, 16 wind in instruments, woodwind and brass, and they're continuously emitting or intermittently emitting. This could be a problem. So how could we do COVID-19? We're not like medical people. Well, this was actually right up in our alley. You see, when someone sneezes, you typically like, you know, try to stand out of the way because why? You don't want to get sick. Why would you get sick if someone sneezes? Because the respiratory, respiratory droplets that they're emitting contain a virus, perhaps. And if you catch that virus, you will get sick. The same thing applies here. 
if these respiratory droplets coming out of the trumpet, out of the trombone, out of the oboe, contain a virus, they're going to be moved by the airflow and transported elsewhere. And so we thought, if we can track the airflow, we can predict where the viruses go. Okay? This was our rhyming slogan that we went with when eventually we got interviewed by NPR and so on once we finished the study. And tracking the airflow is exactly right up our alley. And I will relate this to numerical methods in a minute. This is a picture of a Bravenal Hall. There's, um, I'm taking the picture. This is my colleague, Professor Sutherland. This is one of my PhD students, Hayden. This is one of my other PhD students, Mokbel. Um, taking measurements. Measurements of what? Of the airflow. If you look at the ceiling up there, there's these inlet vents just like in this room here, there's some vents somewhere. You see the AC ducting coming in, and there's the ducts. Can I, yep, these are the vents, right? So there's air coming in. If you look at this one, there's a spider web or something up there moving with the air. So there's air coming in. The air comes in and is mixing, is moving around the room, right? And it's transporting respiratory droplets everywhere. So if we can capture the airflow, we can figure out what's going on. Also on the stage, stage left and stage right, there are two big doors, okay? And on the back, there are return vents. These are going to be important in our analysis. That's me on the upper left and some of the students there taking measurements. All right. Now, I don't want to go into the details. You can find this on um, the YouTube, my YouTube channel. But this was the original orchestra arrangement. And there are two things going on here. There's the size of the instrument and the color of the instrument. The size corresponds to how many particles an instrument is emitting per, per liter. So for example, a trumpet, you know, they're blowing really fast. Bah, 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 bah. There's a lot of respiratory droplets coming out. Okay? Versus the flute, for example. It's very nice and smooth, not a lot of particles coming out. Okay? The color, however, corresponds to how fast these particles are coming. So the trumpet not only emits a lot of particles, it also shoots them way far. So if I'm standing here, I'm playing the trumpet, I can get a particle right there, right there, right? But if I'm an oboe, it's going to be very close to me. I'm going to self-infect myself, right? Trombone is somewhere in the middle. So we call those super emitters and super spreaders anyway. All right, so how do we do this? Well, we know the equations of fluid flows. You probably haven't seen this yet. You're going to see it in year three and year four. If you take grad fluids with me later, you'll see all of these. But know and trust that we know these equations that govern the fluid flow. So these equations tell us how fluids move. If I know the speed over here and I know this room, how it looks like, I can solve these equations to know what the, what the air is going to do in this room. These are the equations. They're, very, they're called coupled nonlinear partial differential equations. Um, very complicated. Very complicated to solve. But we can solve them. Analytically, nope. They're very, very difficult to solve analytically. The only way to solve them is by using numerical methods. The first step to solving these equations is taking this course. I'm not telling you that you take this course, you're going to be solving them immediately. You're going to need a few more courses after that. But this sets the foundation for something real and tangible that you will use in the real world when you're done. All right, so let's show you some eye candy. This is our depiction of a Bravenal Hall. You see these colored things up at the, top, the, at the top, these are the inlet vents. You're going to see a range of colors here, blue through white through red. Red means high speed, blue means very low speed, and white is somewhere in between. And what I'm going to show you now is what the airflow looks like in a Bravenal Hall sped up about 150 times. So the air comes in from the top, and look at that, something happens, kind of merges in the middle, and then recirculates around the front and the back. 
You notice in the back, there are these return vents, so the air kind of gets sucked in, but some of it recirculates back to the top, and it keeps going, and it keeps mixing. So we can show this by what we call um, streamlines. So think of these streamlines as a fluid particle, an air particle. What is it going to do when it's injected into the room? It's going to follow these trajectories. And you will notice there's a region up here where the flow is just spinning in a big vortex and a region in the back, actually two regions, where you have also these things spinning. So we anticipate that if an instrument emits a virus or emits a particle into one of these vortices, it's going to stop, get stuck there and gets accumulated, accumulated until it evaporates eventually. But there's a risk of infection there. So let's quantify that. So next what we did, we took every wind instrument. You see it's these guys that have this kind of orange, reddish looking thing over there. This is initially, assuming they're starting to play, they're emitting just some particles. And you're going to see three colors here. Red is 10 particles per liter. Orange is one particle per liter. And yellow, 0.1 particles per liter. Okay. So 10 liters would do one particle, essentially. So let's see what happens. This is just a tracer. Tracer of the particles if all the wind instruments are playing. Now they're starting to play. Now the wind, the air kicks in. And when we saw this, we're like, yep, there's no way they can play. We did further quantification numerically and calculated exactly how many particles and the risk of infection, etc. You don't have to worry about that. But know that, at least visually, you can tell, like, yeah, this is like a bad idea. They shouldn't be playing. So no good. Then we thought, OK, how about we open the doors? Like, imagine you sit in a car, or you go in an Uber, and the driver is smoking, let's say. What do you do? You roll down the windows, right? You stick your head out of the window so that you don't breathe in the smoke. We thought, well, if we open the doors, maybe we can help some of those particles get out, some of those respiratory droplets. And indeed, this could happen because unlike this building, the orchestra room is very pressurized. So you open the door, there is air that's going out. It's highly pressurized. So there's a net pressure. There's a positive pressure in the room higher than outside. So it's going to push all the air out. So hey, let's use that to our advantage. We clean out the air, the infected air. So we did this, and we kind of ran the calculation. And you see, this, these doors just affected the instruments sitting close to them. They didn't reach into the inside. Didn't do much. So not a significant difference. And to quantify that better, what we did, we looked at the particle trajectories, or the air particles that are affected by the doors. That's it. This is, these are shown in purple here. The, the purple lines are the extent of how far the effect of the door reaches into the uh, stage. OK? So next we said, all right, so let's try to do some science on top of this. We notice that now with the doors open, we have two regions here, here that we can use as windows in, your, in the car, in the Uber. And in the back, we also have these return vents that we haven't used really. So then we propose the unthinkable. Hayden, the PhD student who was taking measurements, he's a classical music connoisseur. He plays the trumpet. Um, and so he knows a lot about orchestra and stuff. So we propose the unthinkable. And we're like, hey, what if we rearrange the orchestra? That is unthinkable, right? Like these orchestral arrangements have been centuries in the making. And for a given hall, for a given orchestra hall, I mean, they're fine-tuned to perfection. And for us to come say, hey, we're just going to rearrange your orchestra based on science. Well, they were open to it. Thierry Fisher the conductor of the Utah Symphony at the time told us, I will do anything to keep my players safe and bring some normalcy to Salt Lake City. And we love that. So this is what we did. Check this out. This is the original orchestra arrangement. And I'm going to superimpose 
the fancy picture that we got from our numerical results of the airflow. Now the idea is, how about we move all of the wind, wind instruments into these purple regions? Okay, so first we move the percussions to the side. Then we put the trumpets and trombones in the back. Poor trumpets, they hated us. Then we move the clarinets to the back. Flutes, we put them up on the stage left. And then French horns. Look at this, bassoons. There you go. A new orchestra design based on a numerical simulation. Can you believe that? We were out of our minds, but we did it. And look what happened. When we ran the numbers for actual infection risk, we reduced the infection by two orders of magnitude. That means by an order of 100. So you are 100 times less likely to be infected. Okay? Once this was all said and done, we went down, we stood on the stage, we took our masks off, took the litmus test, and then the Salt Lake County came in. Like, you cannot allow to do that. Okay, okay, we just posed for the picture and, you know. Two weeks later, the Utah Symphony opened its doors to the public, and we went down there, and they had the doors open. They rearranged the instruments. It was amazing. It was the best work of my entire life. So there's some more results here, but you can read more about this or um, listen to it. We had a KUR, KUER interview, a bunch of articles, and New York Times actually reached out. When I saw the email, I was like, ooh, is this a spam? Anyway, it wasn't spam. So, um, all right. So you can look at this, but this is what numerical methods can do for you. Okay? This is what numerical methods can do for you. So believe that you are learning something very useful. I've built my entire career on numerical methods. All right, so now we can start the course. Welcome to Numerical Methods 2450. My name is Tony Saad. I'm an assistant professor in chemical engineering. I've been here, um, I think, at the University of Utah since 2010 as a postdoc and research professor, and then I became faculty in 2017. I've been teaching this course for seven, year, seven years now, excuse me. Um, and uh, uh, we, we have it humming, okay? Um, you've probably interacted with some of your former colleagues in the Dougal lab and uh, hopefully ho ho heard uh, very scary things about numerical methods. Uh, it is a difficult course, but I know you're up to the challenge. And every year I see you come in and you're more and more up to the challenge. So there's something miraculous about your generation that you know, keeps pushing the boundaries, and I love that, okay? So today's objective is just to get you to know me a little bit, talk about the syllabus administrative stuff. So in a way, the syllabus is our contract between me and you, so that I set the expectations flat out so we don't have to worry about dealing with um, uh, kind of ambiguous things as we move, move on. So I hope you pay attention, and um, we'll have a great semester if you do that. All right. So first, the course website is exclusively on Canvas. I will use Canvas to post homework. If there's an online exam, I'll put it on Canvas. I will communicate with you through Canvas exclusively. Everything is done through Canvas. Lectures, I will do my best to record them. I plan on recording each and every lectures lecture, but sometimes my battery dies and I end up with no audio, okay? So in that case, you can look at the lecture from last year. All lectures are posted on YouTube. I'll tell you more about that in a minute, okay? Um, this is an in-person course, okay? Um, so there's no Zoom option. I'd like you to come in person. I'd like to get to know you and trust me that I will remember all of your faces. I might re not remember all your names because to you, you're only remembering, it's easier for you to remember my name because I'm only one more person you have to learn about. But there's 70 of you, so it's hard for me to remember all your names. I will try to, okay? I will try to get to know you. But trust me, I will remember your face. And I will see you in the hallway because I, my office is right next to the ICC center. And this is where, 
half of your life is going to be spent as you go through our program. Okay? So I will see you every day. I will say hi. And you see me. You do say hi. I will remember you. I will remember your face. I might ask you to remind me of your name, please. Um, anyway, so, hey, you're stuck with me. I'm in your life. You might ask me for a recommendation letter at some point. Half of you do. And so, you know, I, I want to get to know you, and I'd like you to get to know me too. Okay? All right. Now, for YouTube, all the lectures will be posted on my YouTube channel. It's called Professor Saad Explains. Please do subscribe. Um, tell your friends and family and your neighbors to subscribe. And press the like button. It triggers the algorithm. Apparently, it does something and like kind of overranks the video. So um, uh, a lot of people are listening to these lectures, not just from the U. Okay, I, I get comments from all over the world, and I love that. And so we'll keep them open, keep putting them um, on YouTube. It's very effective for everyone. You don't have to worry about recording things here. You'll get crisp quality and um, high quality slides, crisp audio on this YouTube. Okay, email, I will send, um, I will communicate with you through Canvas. Okay, so make sure that your Canvas and Umail are connected to each other that you get announcements from the course and emails from me. Okay? And I'd like you to do the same. If you send an email to my personal email, I get like a thousand emails every morning. You know what? I, I don't even have time to answer all of them. But when I go on Canvas, I only get emails from you. And you're important, and I will answer you on Canvas. If not me, the TAs will. Okay. So communicate through Canvas, especially for course-related stuff, definitely for course-related stuff. If there are other personal issues, you know, send through Canvas and we'll take it from there, okay? Um, office hours, student hours are on Wednesdays. Sorry, there's a typo here, should be um, on Wednesdays from 1 to 2.30 or by appointment. Um, my office is in MEB. 2286, so that's right next to the ICC or the Dougal Computer Lab. So that's on the second floor, right under the Administrative Office for Chemical Engineering. Yeah, you'll, you'll see me there. Um, do come with clear questions. Um, and if you want to meet over Zoom, say you're sick, you can make it to campus. There's a snowstorm. I'm happy to meet with you over Zoom as well. I'll we'll coordinate. I'll send you a link, and we'll do the meeting. Um, help sessions. Um, there will be four help sessions in the ICC lab to help you with homework and exam prep. These help sessions are very important. And frankly, this is where a lot of the learning occurs. And you have two TAs this semester. Um, one of your TAs is here with us, um, Ainsley. She's sitting way in the back over there. Okay. Um, so make sure um, Ariana will be here um, on Thursday, our, your other TA. Make sure you get to know your TAs. Um, they're going to be your um, connection to the course as well. Um, things that maybe are not covered in the class, any gaps in your understanding of the material. Okay? And there are four help sessions, Tuesdays and Thursdays, two on Tuesdays and two on Thursdays, 1 to 2 p.m., 4 to 5 p.m. Okay? Make it, try to make it to any one of those. Technical help and support, like I said, exclusively through Canvas email. Now, if it's like homework created question, clarification, or something like that, send to me and copy Ariana and Ainsley. This way, one of us can get your email within, sometimes within minutes, sometimes within a few hours. Okay, if you send it to me or just to uh, Ainsley or to Ariana, right, there might be a 24 hour you know, um, time to get back to you. But if you send to the three of us, we'll be on board, okay? If you forget, don't worry, we'll tr whoever gets it will copy us back so we can try to address it, okay? But try to remember that, please, and we'll, we'll you know, we'll have a um, track record of everything. Clearly, if there's a personal thing that you want to discuss with me privately, just send the email to me directly, okay? All right. Textbook, well, no textbooks. Based on my slides, I think my slides have been, have accumulated the best of all the textbooks out there. I do, however, inspire a lot from one textbook by Chopra and Canali called Numerical Methods for Engineers. You can get any edition. I will occasionally post PDF chapters from that textbook for you. You know, you want to study a little bit more. There's like some, you want some more immersive understanding. 
Um, but I think my lecture slides cover um, in depth and breadth um, most of the material that you need to understand, okay? Homework assignments. There will be up to 10 homework assignments, um, sometimes nine, sometimes 10, depending on how the semester goes. Each year is different. Uh, this year, I will drop the two lowest, um, uh, lowest assignments, okay? And therefore, that means there are no homework extensions. Okay, so you don't have to worry, you're like, you feel you need an extension, you know what? Just get a zero, it'll be dropped. Okay, we'll drop two homework assignments out of the 10, okay? Homework will be assigned every Thursday and will be due on the Thursday midnight um, the week after, okay? There's a 25% daily penalty for late submissions. So, you know, day four, you lose, um, you'll have 100% penalty, but you know, you're running a little bit late, et cetera. Don't ask for extensions, either take the penalty or take the, um, drop the assignment, okay? Those who have CDA forms um, are provided extensions as, as needed and no more than three days, which is a uh, very usual policy. Um, solutions will be discussed in class only, so I'll do the homework with you in class. Um, because of the nature of the homework assignments, I'm not gonna just post code out there. You can get your code from Stack Overflow or ChatGPT, I don't care, right? But and it's not gonna help you. I want you to get into my brain and th see how I'm thinking about coding something. So I do the homework with you in class. Homework assignments are almost exclusively focused on programming, okay? And we'll talk about that um, in a few slides. The exams, however, are not. The exams are gonna test you on your understanding of the material. All right, now assignments will receive some partial credit. Um, many feel like this is an unfair policy. Why don't you give partial credit um, on homework assignments? Well, because I give partial credit on the exams, a lot of partial credit on the exams. And second, because I want to give you the opportunity to get it right, 100%. Because in reality, I have to get it right for the work I'm doing. Otherwise, people will be in trouble, right? So you have to have some of that exposure, okay? So I give some partial credit, okay? So it's better than no partial credit at all. But you have one week to do the homework assignment. So that means if you start early, you start asking questions, you work through it, you do your best, okay? You learn a little bit, and you try to get it right. Now, your assignments will be submitted as um, Jupyter Notebooks and a PDF copy of the original notebook. If you've taken stats with Professor Zangle, you're probably familiar already with Jupyter Notebooks. If you've taken 1703 with Professor Butterfield, you're also familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. If you're not, um, we'll help you get there, uh, discuss in a little bit and explaining why Python. I started that revolution of Python and Jupyter Notebook in 2017, so now everyone is like adopting it, and next, uh, probably in a few years, we're gonna move away from uh, Python. Anyway, who knows? Um, we'll see, but we have to be um, um, up to speed with that. So Jupyter Notebooks are really cool because they allow you to write a full report. You can put text, equations, math, plots, discussions in one document, whereas you couldn't do that with Word, You'd have a MATLAB script and your Word script or some other script and then your Word document and moving back and forth, it's kind of annoying. So uh, Jupyter Notebooks are great for this. Uh, we will not debug your code for you, so we will help you in your homework during the, when you're working on your homework assignments, we'll be happy to help you work on your code, make it better, make it run, etc. But once you submit the notebooks, we are grading 70 students, right? We are not gonna go through each line of code that you write. I don't care if you write Shakespearean style code, I don't care, it just has to run and get an answer, okay? This class is not about programming, this class is about solving real problems with numerical methods, programming is just a tool, okay? You can, you can get better at programming later in your life, but right now all I care about, I don't care if you, if you do an array, if you hold an array like that, I don't care. As long as you think you know what you're doing, 
there are always, there's always a better way to do something, even for the most experienced programmers, okay? So I'm not worried about that. But your code, your Jupyter Notebook needs to run. You run it, you execute it, and then you export a PDF version of it, and you upload both. Because we will grade the PDF version. If something is iffy or something is not clear, we open the Jupyter Notebook, okay? And we take a look at it, we run it. If it doesn't run, we're not going to spend time debugging it. It's not going to run. So I say your PDF export was all empty or something is off with it. We go to the Jupyter Notebook, it's not running. You know, we may, we'll make an effort to reach out to you, tell you, hey, do you have another version of this? What is going on here? But, you know, you should, you should run your notebook before you sub, run your notebook, export the PDF, and then submit your version um, on Canvas. All right. Assignments must look and read like a regular report, okay, except that they will have code included in them. So you must, therefore, include a discussion of your results. Um, imagine I come to you and I don't have slides. I have like a couple of words on these slides and I'm just rambling over here. That would be annoying, right? You'd expect more from a high quality education, right? Same thing I expect more from you as engineers in the making. Think of your homework as a little project you're doing as an engineer. I want you to tell me what you've done. Write something, talk about it. So if you submit your homework assignment with just code and a bunch of printout statements, you're, you're going to get nothing, no credit, because I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what the code is doing. I don't know what you're solving. The printout statements especially do not count as discussion. This is a critical example. So suppose you have some code that's doing the sum from 1 to 5 or some summation. And then you print sum and 15, and then you move on. Well, that printout statement, pretend that we do not see this. Instead, you, have, you do the printout and then write the discussion. Say, as shown above, the solution is 15. This is because or whatever. You have to type something. Imagine you're writing your report in Word. You get the results from your code, and you type them in Word. You have to do that. Clearly, you're going to get your results from printout statements. You might be printing tables. You might be doing pandas or whatever. I don't care. Copy that panda. Take a screenshot of it and put it. But you have to make an effort to write a discussion. The only exception are plots, OK? Because you cannot type a plot, right? So you do the plot. It's going to show up there. Do the export. It's there. But reference the plot and explain it, OK? Formatting should be clear and should reflect the quality of your work. Again, if no discussion is included, we cannot interpret the results. No points will be given. If we can interpret the results, but no discussion is provided, you will lose 50% for that question, OK, for that given question. If the question has five points on it, you'll get two and a half, OK, if we can interpret your results. This is an example homework template that I have on Canvas. OK, this is me submitting a homework for my course, OK? Look, look this is through Jupyter Notebook. Very simple, homework one, 2450, Tony Saad, unit. This is a homework template, et cetera, et cetera. You start writing problem one, question one. We are asked to do this and that. This is my solution first. I'm going to compute the error, et cetera. And OK, so now I print out a statement over here. Then I have to discuss that print out statement and so on. OK, this is how your report should look like. It's really not rocket science. Yeah, there's no one exact way of doing it. You be creative in writing your reports. But, uh, and I'm not a asking you to do um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, like write up literature. Just write something. Write something so that I can tell that you've thought about what you're doing. Okay? You can download this template from the Canvas front page. There's the Jupyter Notebook version of it, and there's a PDF version of it, um, just for you to kind of see. Okay. Partial credit policy for homework assignments. Um, if the method is correct and no errors, you'll get 100% clearly. If the method is correct but contains like a minor arithmetic or minor programming error, then 20% per error. Let's say, okay, you figured out how to do the summation to sort this array or something, but you messed up the end index, the last index. Well, you had, you had a week to figure this out and debug it, right? So we know you almost got it right, so you lose 20% for that error. Okay, or like you divided, instead of dividing by n minus 1, you divided by n or n plus 1. Okay, so that's a minor error, which is just a typo. On an exam, you know, you don't lose that many points on that. 
But on a homework assignment, you know, you're sitting, you're kind of think as if you are working as an engineer. Okay, you got to get it right. Okay, but you'll get some partial credit. If the solution contains a minor theoretical error, okay, so you've misinterpreted the theory, you've treated, applied the Tomas algorithm on a non-tridiagonal matrix. That's kind of a minor slash major theoretical error. So a minor theoretical error, you lose 40% um, of the points, okay? Um, and finally, if no discussion is included, but we can interpret the results, then no points, and we cannot interpret the results, you're not, you're not gonna, because I don't know what you're doing. You're not gonna get any points, okay? Um, all other errors, like major theoretical error, some, you've answered an entirely different question, you're not gonna get credit for that. So I hope this is clear. I know this is always kind of a little bit bitter early on. Once you go through the first, we'll be very lenient in the first homework assignment so that we clarify the expectation to you first couple of homeworks. But, you know, as you go along, you'll get settled into this. You'll accept it as the reality. And you're like, yeah, you know, this is fine. I'll rise to the challenge and you'll put it behind you, okay? So we've done this again for, I've taught over now, probably over six, 700 students now. Um, and we haven't lost the patient, so, you know, it'll be fine. Okay, quizzes, no quizzes this year. Okay, no quizzes. Yay, can I get a yay? Yes, yay, awesome. Okay, no quizzes this year. They're just too disruptive, I feel, for the class, you know. Okay, exams. There will be three exams and a final. Oh, what the heck, three exams? Okay, so your first exam is gonna be next Thursday, okay? <laughs> what am I gonna ask you about? What happened on June 23rd? Um, no, it's a prerequisite exam. It's, it's really just a free 5% for you, okay? For you to brush up on your prerequisites. So for example, how to write a vector, you know, how to do a vector, vector multiplication, right? How to take a derivative. Very simple, basic stuff, okay? It will be next Thursday online. You'll come here to class, you'll do it over Canvas, okay? 15, 20 minutes. And I will give you a study. It's, in fact, already posted on the Canvas um, front page, a study guide and, and a couple of sample exams. So for each exam, you'll get study guides and sample exams. Um, now, for exam two and three, the midterms, um, they might be either of the handwritten type or entirely online. So handwritten type exams contain less questions than online exams, but the questions are longer and they require more derivations. So the problems are a little bit more um, intense. Versus online exams, you'll get a lot of low stakes questions. Like, you know, what is the standard deviation? Or explain, uh, you know, the standard error. Or can you do linear regression on this one? So very, a lot of low stakes questions, you get them either right or wrong. Now, Online exams um, receive a, uh, do not receive any partial credit because you'll get two attempts and it's a lot of questions, like 20, 25 questions, a lot of low stakes questions, but handwritten exams will receive a lot of partial credit. Um, so you get a little error, you maybe, we maybe duck one point, but then we follow through as if you got it right and try to um, make it work for you. I think we will have handwritten exams this year as well. Um, and for exam zero, like I said, it covers prerequisites. For all exams, you'll be allowed one double-sided sided letter size, no cheat. Um, for exams one and two, they cover only recent material, so they're not comprehensive. For the final exam, it is comprehensive in the sense that, yeah, you still need to, write, to know how to write a system of equations as a matrix, but I'm not gonna asking, be asking you about systems of equations, I'm gonna be asking you mostly about material we covered at the end of the semester. So it's heavily biased towards the end of the material um, on the end of the semesters. semester. For the final exam, you'll get two double-sided letter size, no cheats. Um, make sure you use like a regular font without having to use like a, one time I had a student who had like typeset font five and they had a magnifying glass trying to read, to read their sheet. So, you know, you, use your judgment um, and you don't need uh, a, a magnifying glass to read your note sheets. Okay. For exams, adequate partial credit will be given. For online exams, no partial credit, but you'll get multiple attempts. And here is the grading policy for the course um, and grading weights. So assignments, you'll get 35%. Uh, they count towards 35% of your grade. Uh, for the prerequisite exam, it's 5%. So you get five points 
if you get 100 on exam zero. Exam zero is just prerequisites. You, can you do it, the derivative of sine x? Yeah, you can do that. So, you know, you'll, um, to me, it's, it's like a, it's, it's a guaranteed 5%. Two midterm exams, both of them count towards 35% of your grade, and the final is 25%. Um, this is the grade um, distribution, the grade scaling. Okay, so above 92, you get an A. Above 89, less than or equal to 92, you get an A minus, and so on. Okay? And this year, we're doing a visual syllabus. So if you go and look at the syllabus, it's longer than the iTunes user agreement. And I know nobody reads that. One year, I had like a $50 gift embedded somewhere, somewhere in, the, in the syllabus. Nobody found that because nobody reads the syllabus. So, but it is there. If you want to read it, there might be a little present in there. I, I don't know. Um, but if you want to read the full syllabus, go read it. Um, it details every single policy. Okay? But there's a visual syllabus this year summarizing kind of the most important things. You can get a copy of this also from the front page on Canvas. Um, there's a link to it. It's at the bottom of the front page, and it's in the files directory on Canvas, uh, visual syllabus. Okay? Uh, and I have a little note here about AI and chat GPT. We'll get a chance to talk about that once we start getting um, real into coding. Um, so who's been using GPT? Come on. Okay. Yeah. For fun, for like what? Helping you with coding at all, yeah? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah, so I really don't mind you're using it. To me, it's more of a advanced Google. Um, if it helps you become a better programmer, all the better, great for you. Because I know for this course, everything I've thrown at ChatGPT, um, if you're able to decipher it, if you're able to decipher whatever it gives you, great, then you're a good programmer, you know, what you're getting into. But most of the time, you have no clue what is spitting at you. Okay, and so you'll use it with caution. We'll try to use it together a few times in the homework. But one of the best things I found GPT um, to help in this course is for you to improve your product. So what is your product is a solution to a problem which includes maybe plots, tables, etc. So maybe you go on GPT and say, hey, you know, I got this array and I want to plot it and I want to make a contour plot of these data. Help me figure this out. It gives you an example. You do it. Great. Okay. But trust me, it will not be able to solve the exact specific problems that I'm going to throw at you. Okay. It will help you get there. Like I will ask you to solve a thousand nonlinear equations, coupled nonlinear equations. It will not know how to do that. But it will tell you, hey, here's an example of how you could solve a system of four nonlinear equations. Now, you take that and you build on it to solve your 1,000 equations or 10,000, then great. You know? That's no different than you Googling, how do I solve a nonlinear equation in Python? That's what I do. Why wouldn't you be allowed to do it? Of course, you're going to be allowed to do it. Again, this is not a course about programming and not testing you for your programming skills. Programming is only a tool, a means to an end, okay? I want you to solve the problem, all right? Now, the policy for AI chat GPT is, is detailed in the syllabus. And essentially, I'd like you to tell me what prompt you use, because I want to learn. Some of you are already on the way to be prompt engineers, right? And so that, that's apparently a lucrative job. So if you have some really cool prompts that um, you know, you've come up with, I'd love to learn that from you. So if you've used GPT, just it's not going to count against you. It's, I'm going to be uh, uh, as if it's not there. But I want to know to the, the extent to which you've used GPT. Okay. So you put a statement, say, I've used, uh, I've used the help of GPT, chat GPT, or whatever other AI you're using. Um, and tell me the prompt, if it's a small prompt. Some prompts get really lengthy, right? Um, and I'm happy to discuss with you also um, in the office. Does any one of you have a subscription to OpenAI? Okay. Well, the other thing is um, I was training a GPT for this course. Okay. Unfortunately, so I've trained it on those seven years. I've got all the transcripts of my lectures, all my slides, and it's become, it's become like almost my assistant. Like it would replicate things I would say specifically. 
Um, but unfortunately, it's, uh, it's not available for free. And when, when, they, when they announced the availability of chat GPTs, I was excited. I was like, this is great. I can make the GPT and I can custom tailor it to this course and then have you have at it and work with it because it will help you like with you know, syllabus policy, a bunch of other things specific to the course. Um, so we're not going to experiment with that this year until OpenAI makes them available for free, then I will let you know. So right now, just work with the standard GPT if you want. Um, again, it's supposed to, to elevate you, okay? It's supposed to elevate, numerical methods elevated, okay? Something like that. All right. So here's a little perspective of um, your career as a chemical engineer and where numerical method methods is going to fit in. So in general, you will study um, what we call these conservation laws in engineering. Like, could you think of a conservation law? Conservation of mass, OK, right? Mass cannot be created or destroyed. It can energy, the same, OK? Um, can only change forms. Mass, we do the same with it, right? So it's conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. Those are the foundations of physics and engineering. So you learn fundamental conservation laws. From those, you do heat transfer, fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, all of that. Um, you also learn some approximations and models. And for, with that, you come up with what we call an algorithm, which is a series of steps um, to obtain an answer. What you've probably done in previous years up to, to this point, up to maybe before you um, came to the university, is you maybe solve things by hand, pencil and paper, or a calculator, and you got a solution. Okay? Or numerical methods, which is what you're going to learn here. You've done some of it in 1703 if you've taken that, or some of it with, uh, in statistics. Okay? With numerical methods, Python and Excel. Python is going to be in this course, no more Excel. Okay? Now, other chemical engineering courses are going to focus on fundamental conservation laws, approximations, and models. So you'll be taking mass transfer, fluid mechanics, heat transfer, separations, all of that. So you're going to be in that, um, in that upper tier. 1703, if you've taken it, taught you some numerical methods or exposure to numerical methods, but it was kind of out of context. Like, how do you write a function in Python? Why do I need to write a function in Python? Well, this is what you're going to know in this course, because this is where we fit in. 2450 is going to marry the algorithm to numerical tools. So I'll not be teaching you about physical principles, conservation of mass, et cetera. Instead, I will give you the equation. I'll tell you, hey, you know, trust me, this is the equation for heat transfer. And I explain what it does. You don't have to worry about how it was derived. You'll learn that in your third year. But at least you'll know how to solve it. Because when you get to your third year, we call, third year, we call that the cognitive overload in chemical engineering. You, trust me, you need to be up to speed on your numerical methods. You're going to have to use all of, ask your colleagues, ask your junior colleagues. They're going to be, they use this, this their bread and butter every day, every day. Okay? Okay, my teaching philosophy. If you were to plot, well, at least that's me. If I'm like sitting in a one and a half hour lecture, I'll probably be bored to death, okay? So I get you. I'm a human. So if you were to plot attention versus time, this is typically what happens. You're like super excited. What happened on June 23rd, 2020? 15 minutes later, you're starting to fall asleep. Yeah, that's okay. That's normal, right? It's the reality of things. I cannot teach this course in 15-minute intervals. I cannot bring you here every day for 15 minutes or like do seven sessions a day for 15. So we have to kind of cram it down in an hour and a half, an hour, 20 minutes. Okay, so how do we, and then at the end you wake up because like, okay, it's time to go and then everybody wakes up when you go, okay? So what, what do we do? Um, what I try to do is this. This is what I want. I want this, this coil. And this approach um, is called active learning. So every about 15, 20 minutes, we'll do something, an activity. For example, I'll pose a question, a challenge problem. You'll split into groups. You start talking and being loud. I'll put the lights on, make them a little brighter. There you go. Okay. And we talk about it. We solve it together. 
Then maybe on the next activity, I'll tell you a story, okay, motivating story or something. Or maybe after that, we take a break, do another activity, we do a review, another activity, and so on. The purpose is try to keep you in that upper tier attention plan, attention region. I get it, guys. Okay, it's a long lecture. When we'll be standing here and talking and talking, you might get sleepy, you might be tired, you have other things on your mind. But give this material a chance, give me a chance, try to be engaged, and I'll make it worth your while. There are some lectures that for the life of me, they are naturally boring. Right? I mean, I am going to fall asleep, right? So I'm going to try to spice it up, keep it alive as much as I can, okay? And I hope you will be, you know, engaged with me because you all, if I see you, like, alive and active, I'm going to be even more alive and active. So it's, it's this kind of self-feedback loop. I use an inductive-based approach. Um, I don't know if you know the difference between inductive and deductive. An inductive-based approach is exactly what, uh, I have two boys, one is six, one is three, and they love just <laughs> dropping things down the stairs. So my little one, when he started learning about gravity, so he had these like plastic little balls, and he would just go up the stairs and start dropping them. And, you know, he would drop them every day, and he was apparently learning that things fall. And then the next day, he was, like, dumping Legos down the floor and, like, all his toys. Like, yes, things fall down the stairs. Things fall down the stairs. Okay? And that's an inductive approach. In a way, you learn by example. You learn by little steps. You make a little observation here, a little observation there. And you come up with a hypothesis. Things fall. And then from the hypothesis, you verify it and turn it into a theory. That's primarily my teaching approach. We work on little things, observations, and then we try to come up with a theory, with a hypothesis that summarizes all of our observations. Okay? The deductive approach, on the other hand, starts with a general law and then applies it to special cases. Now, this could happen in some courses, in some of the examples, like you know Newton's law. Right? Summation of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. We're going to start there, and then we'll apply it to a parachutist falling down okay, in the air right, with a parachute on. Okay? So, but it's for numerical methods, for the new material that you're learning, we will be doing an inductive approach. If you know the material that I'm covering, fine. You know, just listen to it again. Okay? Because trust me, there's going to be a point where there's something that you haven't known, or you, you, haven't, you don't know yet, or uh, a way present, I'm presenting it in a way that is different from what you, the way you've learned it. Okay? Active learning, I'll explain this on Thursday. Um, well, I kind of alluded to that on that curve. So you'll be split into groups, and each group is going to have a funny name. Okay, the funnier the name is, the less likely I'm going to call you. <laughs> so you'll have a you know, group name, and we'll put a tag in front of you, like come up with crazy, funny names. Um, and then you'll, that will be your group for the semester. We'll pose challenge questions for discussion, and you have at it, you talk about it, and then I'll call your group, and we have a discussion with other groups, with me, and think about it out loud, okay? Um, and finally, uh, my approach is the storytelling style. Um, so I, I try to walk around, pause, be loud, okay, sometimes be quiet, you know, turn, dim, dim the lights, etc., just to try to keep you, keep you attentive and try not to fall asleep myself. Okay? All right. Survival tips. Okay. This class is about numerical methods, not programming. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, three to four. Yeah. So you can either self-select or, you know, just kind of naturally, I can see you're kind of naturally aggregating into your own groups. So three is a good size, four is okay. Okay. So the class is, n is about numerical methods, not programming. Okay. Therefore, the goal of this class is to do, uh, clearly, okay, I don't know who put that, what state of mind I was in when I put that bullet point. Okay, 
Now, the interesting thing is that to do numerical methods, you need programming. You can come up with the method by hand. You can say, I can solve this equation using this formula. OK, but then let's go and apply. There's no way we could have done the Utah Symphony work doing all of those mini steps. There's millions of what we call time steps and billions of 15 million grid points to be able to solve that by hand. We need a computer to do that. We need a supercomputer to do that. So you really need computers to do any serious numerical methods. Although the, new, the methods themselves, themselves are entirely theoretical, like constructs of the brain, OK? So this is kind of a dilemma now. This course is not about programming. It's about numerical methods. But to do numerical methods, you need to, to do programming. So the programming burden is going to fall on you, OK? So you need to brush up on your programming skills now. Now, what does this mean? I'm not expecting you to come and be able to do um, nonlinear, uh, multi-dimensional nonlinear regression today. No, I will teach you how to do that. But I expect you to at least in the coming weeks be able to open Jupyter Notebook based on how the explanation in the syllabus and what I'm going to explain in the next slides. Be able to open Jupyter Notebook, be able to import NumPy, for example, import matplotlib generate a simple plot, know what lint space is, know what an array is, OK? And I'll take it from there with you, OK? We're going to do a lot of programming together. And I will make mistakes, on, not on purpose, because I make mistakes. I'll make mistakes with you here. And I'll be like, oh, crap, what happened? OK, then I will ask Google, maybe, or just kind of think about it together. And one of you will correct me. You messed up the index over there. Oh, of course, OK? So because it's a process, right? And the process is what matters. We will work together on improving your programming skills, okay? but you have to make a serious effort to learn. And you got to start your homework early. Um, when possible, review the class notes. Um, before, la before the lecture, I will, 99% I, will, I will post the PDF of the lecture before the class. Okay? So if you have a minute, look at it on the bus, on your way here, just don't trip. Just kind of look at it, right? In your Uber while you're sticking your head out of the window from the smoke. So, OK? Review class notes before the lecture or review them after the class, maybe. I know this is not the only course. There's a funny thing that happens to, to teachers. It's like they, we think that this is the only thing in your life going on right now. You don't have family. You don't have any other course. You have nothing. This is the only thing you're doing. And I know that's not true, OK? So I get it. If you didn't get a chance to review the lectures, I get it. You're probably going to review the lecture just before the homework is due. This is it's life, right? But do an effort. Try to do an effort. If you have, life is not going to get, you're not going to get more free time in the following years. You're going to get less and less and less free time. So make, you have some free time, make the best of it. Try to get on top of your learning. Because once you become an expert, what happens to you, you'll become a faster learner. OK, so you don't have to spend a lot of time learning something new, OK? Now, before doing homework, try to rework the examples that we did in class. And if you get stuck, please get help, OK? So the help could, doesn't mean, hey, solve this for me. Help means you come to me like, hey, I'm trying to apply this stupid Tomas algorithm on this equation. And I'm like, I'm starting here, but I can't. Like, this index is 0. Oh, OK. Let's sit down, and we'll work with it. Whereas if you come and say, I didn't come to the lecture. I didn't study it and explain it to me. I'm not going to explain it to you. Because that's going to take an hour to explain it to you. And frankly, I can explain it to you, but I cannot learn it for you. You have to do your learning, right? I can tell you all day long how a stick shift works in a car, right, in the clutch, et cetera. But until you get in the car and start making these mistakes and learning yourself, you're not going to be able to drive a car with a clutch and a stick shift, right? So you need to make an effort, demonstrate an effort, whatever that effort is, OK? So that you come with a clear question and we can focus. And then as I'm focusing with you, I'm like, OK, there's a gap here. Let's cover this gap. And I'll be happy to. I will spend two hours with you. I don't care. But it has to, to, you have to demonstrate that you've made a little effort to try to comprehend the material on your own, OK? Come to the help sessions. Ask your colleagues. 
collaborate with each other, talk to each other, but don't copy each other's work. I know many of you will be working on the same code. Don't work on the same code. Talk to each other and write your own code. Put your own variable names, write in your own style. But you can talk about it. Say, yeah, we probably here need to go from 0 to n minus 1. Oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe you called it k minus 1. Maybe you called it j over there, right? But don't copy, don't write a single code. Okay? We'll, we'll, we'll see that. Okay? We will see that. I want you to do the effort. You're, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't help you if somebody writes your code with, for you. Okay? Okay? And take advantage of the help sessions. Now, homework thoughts. Um, getting an answer is not the goal. It's for you to think critically about the answer. Um, writing code is not the goal. Again, I don't care if you write Shakespearean style code. If you write it, great. If you don't, I don't mind. I might give you a tip, tell you, hey, you could do better here if you do a, iter a, a um, iterator loop ra rather than a, a range loop or whatever, right? But it's just a tip. It's not a mistake. It's not wrong, okay? Um, and how you present your results is often as important as the re results themselves. So you need to interpret um, and explain what you're doing. Okay. Let's talk about programming. So this is my perspective of, on programming. Um, any of you speak more than one language? Okay, great. So I'm trilingual. And trust me when I tell you, I can express the same idea in three languages. That's the same with programming. To sort an array is the idea. You can do it in MATLAB, you can do it in C++, you can do it in Python, you can do it in whatever. The programming language itself does not matter. There are programming languages that are more beautiful than others or easier to use than others. But that's not the point. The point is to know that you need to sort the array. That is more important. That's what, that's what makes you the engineer here. Not how to sort it, because once you know that you need to sort the array, you can just go and Google and tell GPT, how do I sort an array in Python? How do I sort it in R? How do I sort it in MATLAB? But knowing that you need to sort an array is the lesson here. Okay? So you're trying to solve a problem, I present you with a problem, you're like, okay, I need to explore the error of computing the derivative as we change the rise over run, as we change the run. Okay? What do I need to do? I need to create an array, and you do the pseudocode in your head. I need to create an array of this, and then loop over it. How do I loop in Python? Okay, there, there it is, right? You go Google it, do chat GPT, I don't care. That's, that's what I would do. But knowing what you need to do is more important. The programming language is just, just a language. It's the clothes on the idea, okay? We just happen to use Python because it's free. You can mix uh, your your high quality text and plots, et cetera, with your code. That's it. It's just a matter of convenience. OK. Um, so I use this approach to write code for, my, for all, all the problems. Now, why do we choose Python? Because it's free forever. It's very easy to get started programming with Python. It's very, very forgiving. OK? It will just let you do things. Something like C++, which is what where those simulations I showed you, there's over 15 million lines of C++ code written for those simulations that I showed you. I've spent since 2010 developing that code with my colleague here at the U. And C++ is not forgiving. If you make a mistake like with a capital letter or like add the wrong types, it will throw an error and will freak out. Python, oh, sometimes I can add integers and floats and things like that. And like, it just works sometimes, most of the time, right? And so, you know, I like that. It's very forgiving. Because my objective is for you to get to an answer, right? Eventually, you'll get better at the programming, right? But the point is to get, well, I said the answer is not the goal. <laughs> so the point is to get to solve the problem. Let's put it this way, OK? Um, Python is in very high demand. So at least a couple of years ago, it was ranked between number three and five. There's more stats now. It's coming up to being number one. So having programming on your, having Python programming on your resume is a good thing for you, for your career. It's very forgiving, significant community and support around it. Um, and you can even use Python in a web browser. So this bullet point was written in 2017, just a, a year after Jupyter Notebook, a year, a couple of years after Jupyter Notebook 
was being made aware. We were the first to adopt it. We had the first Jupyter Hub in the entire state of Utah. We had work with CHPC. We had this kind of, now you download it on Anaconda, with Anaconda and whatever, right? But we had like our own Jupyter Hub. You go on chpc.utah.edu. Most of you signed up for that, and you can just do it in a browser. You don't have to install anything. OK, I like that. And you can use Google to learn Python or ChatGPT. I don't care. OK, so there will be two ways we access Python. Some of you already have Python installed. Um, great, don't worry about it. Those of you who are new to Python, I would recommend the first method is imagine you don't have to install anything. You just go to a web browser and you have your Python environment. You can write code, do text, math, plots in it. Wouldn't that be great? Well, that thing already exists okay, through the Center for High Performance Computing, CHPC. That's the building just south of here. So if you look out the window, there's a build, uh, no, actually a little bit down, sorry. The building across here is the Earth Sciences. Just the building down from it is the Center for High Performance Computing. These people run a big supercomputer for the University of Utah, and they run all our kind of scientific computing uh, foundations. And so they created for us this uh, Jupyter Hub instance. Jupyter Hub is simply where you access Jupyter. Okay, it's just a central repository where you access Jupyter. Don't worry about that. You do need an account, though. This is what you do. You go to chpc.edu, role user student, go to that link, and select this class. This is your token for this class. And you go and create a, an account with them. Okay, this token will expire on February 15th. Okay, many of you have already done that. Great. If not, go and do it today and email us if, you have, if you're having issues. Once your account is set up, then go to this link, ondemand-class.chpc.u.edu, and then you'll see a bunch of apps. Select Jupyter, and then there you go. You have a Jupyter notebook in front of you. Okay, you don't need to install anything. The second way to access Python is to download your own Python distribution via Anaconda. Most of you have already done that. Um, so. If, if not, you want to install it locally, just go Google Anaconda, download it, double-click install. It will guide you through it, and you'll have the whole thing on your, um, on your computer. Okay. Now, it's your responsibility to learn Python. Um, there's a lot of resources in the syllabus. There's a section dedicated to Python, like Google Learning University. There's a bunch of um, free courses on YouTube, on the web. There's a lot of stuff over there. Feel free to use any of those, okay? Just to get you started, we will not be using a lot of fancy stuff here. I tell you, all you need here is NumPy and NumPy arrays, matplotlib, okay? And as we learn about the tools like linear algebra solve, fsolve, I will introduce those to you. But at least you need to be able to import NumPy, import matplotlib, create a linear space, make a plot of a function, and you're almost there. Do a printout statement so that you get your result, and you're almost there, OK? OK, the syllabus is full of resources to learn Python. And there's a little link here for an easy tutorial on Python that I put together a few years ago. Um, it introduces the basics as well. So you can start there if you want, and that gets you most of the way, OK? Um, some tips for solving problems. You have to clearly define your inputs, what you know about the problem, and what you're trying to find. Okay, in a way, um, that helps you structure kind of where you start and where you want to end up. Write down your solution procedure, like think about it. Say, okay, first I need to, let's say, again, I go to this example. This is going to be on your homework one, um, on errors. They say you want to calculate the error in computing the derivative numerically for different values of spacing. Right? And like, OK, how do I do this? Well, I need a list of spacings, delta x or h, whatever it's called, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.125. OK, then I need that list. Then I'm going to compute the error. For in the, I'm going to compute the derivative with each one of those spacings. I'm going to compare that to the exact solution. OK, great. There goes your algorithm. Now you go to Python and start implementing that in Python Okay, and get your result. So it really helps you be organized and plan your solution procedure. Um, when possible, separate 
different aspects of the problem. So there might be an error analysis. They might, there might be a convergence analysis. So separate the two. Um, and you'll see that becomes clearer as we get through more complex homework. Um, it's very important also to test your solution procedure, um, what we call verification. Uh, let's say you're trying to implement what we call Newton's method for nonlinear equations. And you decide to write your own code to do Newton's method. How do you know it works? I would test it on a problem that I did by hand or on a problem where I know like the exact answer. Okay? Very simple. So you test it on that first. You're like, okay, I have confidence in the routine I wrote. Maybe test it on a couple of ones. And they're like, okay, it's solid. Now I'm gonna test it on this new problem that I don't know the answer to. Okay? And plan your numerical implementation, like I said. Um, you, we will learn as we go along that it might be necessary to separate different pieces into subroutines. That's a little bit, uh, we're not going to see that early on. We'll see it uh, maybe six, seventh uh, week of the course. Um, and again, test your code on simple problems, okay? So that's it for this intro. I have a few slides on Jupyter for those of you who don't know what Jupyter is. Let me run through those first. Okay. Let me see. Can you? Let me see. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Because I don't have audio connected to the. This is the way, <laughs> old-fashioned way we do the audio for videos. Let's see. Can you hear anything? Folks to feed the cars. We'll get them to cry out loud. Huh? We're the IBM man, right? Yes, sir. We'll pull my squad if you have to. Understood. I'm not paying any of you. When the first IBM came to NASA, it was not a, an easy transition. No one thought to measure Can you hear? I'm afraid not, sir. Nobody knew how to use it. Computers were these big units that took up the whole entire wall. There's more computing power in a toaster today than what was available to these people in the 1960s. When Dorothy sees the IBM being built, she learns how to program them. She realized really quickly that the IBM was going to be the way of the future. The IBM 7090 data processing system. It has the ability to solve problems that cannot be solved in a lifetime of manual labor. <laughs> What's your name again? Dorothy Bond. We need the IBM for Glenn's launch. We got a job to do. Whatever happens up there, it's in God's hands. My gals are ready. They can do the work. Ladies, we've been reassigned. She basically saved her whole team's jobs and created a value for herself. It's so funny what we think of as computers now and what they were then. All right. One, one of the best movies out there, if you haven't seen it. Um, so, you know, growing up, I was really, like, obsessed with, uh, with space and, like, putting things in. In fact, I did my PhD at the University of Tennessee Space Institute. We had astronauts um, as, like, sitting next to me in class. I'm like, oh, please, can I touch you or take a picture with you? So, anyway, it, it, great stuff. So, um, Dorothy, if you haven't seen Hidden Figures, she was instrumental in putting Glenn uh, in orbit because she was able to program that new IBM computer, supercomputer at the time, okay? Um, and she learned programming. Yeah, that's what you're going to be doing here. But also, we're going to come back to hidden figures later on. She used what's called Euler's method, if you've seen the movie. We're going to learn about that method. She solved the differential equation to figure out where to place that capsule in orbit. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. If you also like movies, you've probably seen this, this picture, Ratatouille. Has anyone seen this little, little animation? If you haven't seen it, you should also see it. It's a great film. I, I really love film. So in, it's a film about this rat that speaks, apparently. Very cute rat, but that speaks. And the rat has an impeccable sense of taste and smell, which they do. And so he's apparently a great cook, and he wants to experiment he wants to follow his lifelong dream of cooking. Um, and he ends up kind of working with this um, 
guy who wants to be a chef but doesn't know how to cook, etc. So starts kind of working, pulling his uh, his hair like a marionette and kind of moving different food items, etc. So the point is, Chef Gustave is the guy who uh, inspired uh, you know the kid to be a to be to inspired the rat to be a cook. And Chef Gustave always said, anyone can cook. And so I inspired that, and I'm going to tell you anyone can code. Okay, so for those of you who are scared of coding, it is not rocket science, it is not a mystery, okay? Anyone can code. If I can code, you can code. And it's even easier now with all the resources and tools that we have, okay? So I don't want you to be scared of programming. Now, Python. Why do we use Python? Um, according to IEEE Spectrum, this is a magazine uh, for electrical engineering. These stats are from 2019, sorry, I haven't updated them, but um, right now, uh, so ranking for Python in terms of score of ability of what it can do is number one, can do web development, can do scientific computing, hasn't done, like if you see these little icons over here, can do web development, desktop applications, um, apps on the phone, et cetera. I don't know what this one is, but Python is ranked at the top. And in terms of jobs on indeed.com, Java at the time trumped Python, but now Python is, I bet you it's, it's way ahead of Java. We can update those, those results. Now, um, there's a lot of Python in your future. Python is free. It's really easy to get started with it. It's very forgiving. And there's a significant community about Python. And you can use Python in a web browser. To me, when I took over this course, the first time I taught it, um, everybody was terrified of programming. We were doing it with MATLAB, and it's like, I don't even know how to use MATLAB. Okay. If I have to, I'll do it, but it's, to me, it's such like a barrier to it. I need to install it and get a license and call the president to make it work. Imagine you just came in and went to a website and just started writing code. There you go. I removed half of the barrier of entry to programming, right? So we wanted to do that. And apparently, the Python people came up with uh, Jupyter Notebook. Essentially, it's, an, it's a web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, equations, visualizations, and explanatory text. Jupyter Notebook, FYI, has nothing to do with Python. It supports over four, you can do R with it, you can do even C, you can do Fortran in it. Jupyter Notebook has nothing to do with Python. It came out from the Python community. It's mostly used with Python, almost exclusively, but it's just a way of combining code and text together. Brilliant idea. So you must install and use it locally unless you combine Jupyter with Python and you get something um, nuclear. Amazing. So Jupyter Hub, it puts Jupyter Notebook on a server and provides access to users. So no need to install anything locally. So Jupyter Hub, you can connect to it through different computers. Do not confuse Python, the core programming language, with Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook, or Jupyter Hub. This, this is a web application that allows you to mix code, text, and figures. So Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Notebooks have nothing to do with Python. We use them with Python. By default, they come with Python, but you can use them with other languages as well. It has nothing to do with Python. Anaconda is just a distribution of Python. There are other distributions. Anaconda is not Python. Anaconda is one way to install Python on your machine. And Spider or PyCharm, some of you are using it, those are code editors. You can edit your Python code in a text editor, in Notepad, or Notes, or um, PB Edit, or whatever, okay? Spider and PyCharm, they just make coding easier. Again, they are just code editors, okay? Um, so for, for CHPC, the link used to be ondemand.chpc.u.eu. Right now is on demand. So if you do that, that's kind of more for the research space. So. Let me just edit this link a second here, please, and I'll let you go in a minute. And class. Okay. Okay, there you go. All right. And then I have a GitHub repository with a bunch of example code. Called, I call it CampPy. It's like NumPy, you know, CampPy. So you can get to it on github.com, on my GitHub. Satoni um, forward slash Kempai. And uh, yeah, with that, right on time. Thank you so much um, for your attention. I'll see you on Thursday.